a blessing and we invite you to come as often as you have the time to be in the house of the Lord and to worship the Lord with us. Amen. God has been truly good to us and amen. Certainly another first Sunday. We are certainly um, blessed to be in the house of the Lord. I'm going to invite your attention to the book of Colossians chapter number three and just a couple verses. Verse number 23 and verse 24. would like to um, just invite our, all of our guests that we do have an evening service which begins at 6.30 and we would like to have you back again uh, to be with us and enjoy the, the word of God and the choir and the atmosphere. Tonight, of course, is our first uh, Sunday night and that means we have um, church from uh, Victory, the one from Bethesda also. Um, I'm not sure if those from St. Petersburg are going to be here. They are still continuing their process of trying to get a permanent uh, pastor for that church. And so we do have a um, uh, family that is in there this week and so I don't know if they'll be here tonight but we're expecting the Lord to be here and to bless us in a marked way so do come tonight with your hearts filled with faith and God will certainly do us good Colossians chapter 3 and verse 23 and whatsoever ye do do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto men, knowing that of the Lord ye shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for ye serve the Lord Christ. And I'm going to take a thought from this topic, the power of positive action, the power of positive action. And uh, we just ask God to touch our hearts and to help us to be good recipient of the word of God. Let us pray. Father, we thank you one more time for your loving kindness, Lord, and your tender mercies. We appreciate all that you've done for us. Thank you for Calvary. Thank you, Lord, how you laid your nail-scarred hand upon us, O oh God, and pull us out of darkness into this marvelous light. And we thank you for the church of the living God which you testified you would build and the gates of hell would not prevail against it. And we thank you that you've made us part of the church and we thank you that you filled us with your spirit, put your word in our mouth. And Lord, we thank you for all that you have done. Thank you for the word in the reading of the word of the Lord which is able to make us wise unto salvation. Now, Touch our hearts, I pray, and let thy word go in, Lord, and find room so that it may germinate and grow and fruit. Touch the lips of clay, Lord, I pray that you may touch me in a very special way today and give me unction of the Spirit so that what is said, Lord, would be benefited. Those that hear, hear from heaven, Lord, and answer our prayer, for we ask it in Jesus' name and all the people say, amen. God bless you, and you may be seated. The power of positive action. To become a spiritually mature saint of God you simply cannot respond to all of the various problems and hardships that will constantly come in your life. 
I believe that we have to somehow drown out much of the negative chatter that could bombard our minds on a daily basis. Because failing to do this could easily bring on chronic depression or spiritual fatigue. In examining the life of Paul, I do believe that we can find the secret to Christian maturity. It is not that he did not go through difficulties because he cataloged for us some of the difficulties that he faced in his letter to the Corinthians. But the fact is, regardless of all of those difficulties, all of those setbacks, all of those challenges, the thing that made him press forward and mature was the fact that he was always taking some positive action. The epistle written to the, Rome, to the Philippian saints from the pen of Paul comes to us from a Roman, a Roman jailhouse. And you will see in this epistle the mindset that this good man of God had. In Philippians chapter 4, verse 4, he is rejoicing in the Lord always. In verse 7, he is experiencing the peace that passes all understanding. And in verse 11, he has learned the secret of contentment. Remember, he's in a jail. And he is there not because he's done anything wrong, but because... He is a preacher of righteousness. We never see him as one that is petrified by fear so that he is hiding and cowering. He is never trembling about the future. But he's always busy doing today's work. He never lived in despair. But he was mindful of the loss that he was called to reach. In the book of Acts, he is one that hazarded his life for the sake of Jesus Christ. Please notice, if you will, the apostle's demeanor and his posture in 1 Corinthians 16, verses 8 and 9. He says, but I will tarry at Ephesus until Pentecost. For a great door and effectual is open unto me, and there are many adversaries. And you would probably just gloss over, pass over this. But when you stop to just examine what this man was saying, he is saying, I'm going, to, I'm going to remain here in Ephesus and I'm going to be doing a work for God. We understand, he says, that there is a lot of opposition, but he said there's an effectual door that is open there. There is a, there is a window of opportunity that is here, and I'm going to stay here. But he says, there are lots of devils here. We ought to remember always that if we are going to do a work for God, that the demons of hell are going to op oppose us. The demon from every place is going to oppose you if you're going to do a work for God. 
you are going to experience opposition. And don't expect demons to come in some of those forms that the devil is sometimes pictured as taking on. Demons of hell are going to oppose you and demons work through people. And you need to know that it is the people that you have to deal with on a daily basis. Some of them may even be your relatives in your family. But they are going to be used by the enemy of our soul to oppose the work of God. At the end of the day, we must resolve to do something that is going to stretch us. We simply cannot just remain in that comfort zone, but we have got to take some positive action to change the whole dynamics of where we are. And, so today, and so today, I'm going to offer four things for our consideration. Firstly, we need to do something to enrich your Christian life. Do something to enrich your Christian life. Don't just sit back and let life happen to you. Don't just sit back and let the devil take the battle to you. You need to do something that is going to enrich your life. People take various courses to help themselves in a secular way, but do something to enrich your Christian life, to help you in your relationship with God. Now, I'm going to mention several things here that we could focus on. Number one, get serious about Bible study. You can study the Word of God by a subject. You can take a subject, take a character, a person, and study that. What made that person stand out? What made Joseph such a pristine character? What made him be like a perfect type of Jesus Christ? Or you could study some kind of an event in Scripture. Study it. Become proficient. Know what it's all about. Young people sometimes could get involved in Bible quizzing and memorize the word of God. David said, thy word have I hid in my heart that I may not sin against you. Study the word. I think there's many times a study of the word of God and put in your memory where scriptures are taken from is going to serve you well. So get serious about studying scripture. There are people in this world that study various sports figures. They memorize their statistics. Baseball player, basketball player, football player. They memorize all those statistics and they can tell you all of those things about that play player. Why not memorize something about the word of God? Why not commit to memory some verses so that if someone brings up a, an argument or they bring up some kind of a uh, 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 a score, uh, 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 some kind of a mention about someone, you know where to find it. You're able to pull from your repertoire of scripture where to find that. That's, that's beneficial. So study the word of God. Become serious about it. What are you doing? You are trying to enhance your Christian walk with Jesus Christ. Number two, you could make a list of all the blessings that God has blessed you with and then give some thanks for it. Because if you never start to enumerate or list or write down some of the good blessings of God, you will think that you're poor and God has not remembered you. But there is an old songwriter he says, when upon life billows, you're tempest-tossed. When you're discouraged, 
thinking all is lost. Count your many blessings. Name them one by one, and it will surprise you what the Lord has done. And the chorus says, count your blessings. Name them one by one. Count your many blessings. See what God has done. So write some things down. And then start to thank God for what he has done. Number three, read a good Christian book. Get a Christian book. Matter of fact, there is, there is a, 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 a brand new book that I've written that you could invest in. You could buy that book today if you so chose, and, and you can read some things that will give your mind something positive to think about, something that will uplift you. We live in a world that is negative as it is. So read something that will uplift your heart. Something that is positive. Do not get bogged down with the negatives of this world. Because in many cases, you can't change them anyhow. So there's no point in you getting bogged down with them. But think of something. Take some action that is going to propel you to another level. Number four, put away all bitterness and anger. Get rid of it. Make a list of everyone that have ever wronged you. A list of, of all the people who have done you wrong. Or a list of people who have something, that you have something against them. Make a list of that. Then forgive all of them. And then pray for them. It is very difficult to hate those who you are praying for. I had one preacher one time. He said that he was talking to the Lord about a member in his family. And he had been praying and asking God to heal them. And he wondered why the Lord wouldn't heal them. He's praying hard. And very, very concerned about that relative. But he felt like God wasn't listening. And God reminded him, he said, now, you went and you prayed for someone. And he said, the Lord said, you didn't even pray like you meant it. You didn't even pray like you, you mean it at all. You just kind of prayed with no unction, no intent. And I healed that person. Now, why would you think I wouldn't be hearing you if you're praying this strong prayer? So I want you to know sometimes we may Say, well, we're going to pray for that person, but we're not going to pray very convincingly. But when you forgive, I want you to pray a strong prayer that God will help them. That God will bless them. And so you need to do something to enrich, enrich your life. Change, do something to move you off from where you are. Secondly, do something for your family. And here I could mention several things. First, ask your husband or your wife to forgive you for being grouchy or mean or inconsiderate. Because sometimes we just take each other for granted. And we just say things that come to our minds without thinking. Number two, express appreciation and thanks for what loved ones do for you. Because there's many times we just take those things again for granted. 
in Luke chapter 17, beginning from verse 13, the Lord encountered some people that needed some help. And the Bible said that they lifted up their voices and said, Jesus, Master, have mercy on us. And when he saw them, he said unto them, go show yourself unto the priest. And it came to pass that as they went, they were cleansed. And one of them, when he saw that he was healed, turned back and with a loud voice glorified God and fell down on his face at Jesus' feet, giving him thanks. And he was a Samaritan. And Jesus answering said, were there not ten cleansed? But where are the nine? He says, there are not found that return to give glory to God, save the stranger. So that says to me that God is paying attention if you're giving thanks. People do something for you. And you need to be thankful. Tell them thanks. I mean, I don't necessarily looking for people to thank me, but I want to help them. But here, the Lord is paying attention, said, now, did I not cleanse ten and only one came back to say thanks? So God is looking to see if you're thankful. So when someone does something for you, tell them thanks. Write them a thank you note. Telephone them. Let them know you appreciate it what they've done. Number three, hug your children. Tell them that you love them. They may not be all that you want them to be, but tell them that you love them anyhow. Sometimes just a few positive words could change the direction of those children. Number four, stop griping and start giving compliments. Pay some compliments to somebody. It's not, it's not hurting you. You're not giving them a check. Pay them some compliments. Tell them that you appreciate that. Tell them they look good. I mean, they, they may not look like Cleopatra or one of those strong looking guys, but let them know they look all right. Amen. It's amazing how just a little compliment can go a long, long way. Because sometimes we are just simply too self focused. Too much self. We just focus on ourselves. That's all we can think of the entire day is just self, self, and more self. Thirdly, do something for your church. Do something for your church. It's your church. It's not my church. It's your church. It's our church. It's the Lord Jesus Christ church. It's not, church doesn't belong to me. So do something for your church. Offer to use your car to bring people to church. Don't say, I got a nice Cadillac. I don't want anybody sitting up in there with me. Bring, offer to bring them. Don't feel like it's going to inconvenience your family. Move over the kids and let somebody else sit in there. Talking about you got a new Rolls Royce. You don't want anybody in there. Offer to bring someone to the house of God. Number two, visit or call those who are absent and send me a report on it. Or give the report to Sister Ann Campbell. I noticed on the, the scroll announcement that there are people that's absent. And if they're absent and they sit close to you, you know they're absent, call them up. Find out where they, why they're absent. Find out if they're in the hospital. Visit them. 
and then give a report. Thirdly, increase your giving. Think about increasing your giving. We're expanding. You can notice that the, we're, we're clearing the, 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 the addition there on the north side and on the south side. So we're expanding. We're going to be putting in roughly 10,000 square feet 10,000 square feet of new building. And uh, as a consequence, we're going to need furniture. So buy a chair. Buy a few chairs for the fellowship hall. Buy a few tables. Increase your giving. Sister Ann will have a list of what some of those chairs will cost and the tables will cost. Sign up. Put your name on there. What are you doing? You're taking action. You're not just sitting down. You're taking some positive action. That is what Paul was doing. He wasn't sitting around waiting for life to happen. He's happening life. He's making life. He's changing the course. And in order to change our mind, we got to take action. Number four, refuse to take part in any gossip or criticism of leadership in church. When you hear people are doing that, walk away. Leave them alone. Don't add anything to it. Let them be isolated. Don't you join in. Don't you be one that trying to kill the church. Number five, join the choir. We're looking for a large choir. Join the choir. There's, there's voice lesson that's given, so join the choir or you could use some of the other talents that you've been sitting down and hiding. Sitting down on those good talents you have or hiding them. Use some of those talent to further the kingdom of God. Take some positive action. Take something, do something for God. And I do believe when we start doing something for God, God is going to bless us. God is going to smile upon us. God will bless your life. Amen. He'll make you a blessing to the kingdom. He'll cause you to be a conduit of his grace. He will lose you like a pipeline to bring people, amen, to the place where they can be of value to the kingdom. And fourthly, do something to fulfill your responsibility to the seeking and the saving of the lost. Man, we, you, 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 that's part of our responsibility to the work. In one text, Jesus was moved with compassion when he saw the lost. He described them as sheep that had not a shepherd. And our Lord was moved with compassion. When we take our eyes off ourselves, and our families, and we start to focus on the lost of this world, then we're going to take responsibility. We're going to take ownership. In this city of Tampa, I have taken ownership that I've got to do everything I can to reach people with Bible salvation. I want you to catch the same spirit. I don't want you to get bogged down with your life, bogged down with your problems. Bob done with all things that ails you. All of those things going to be there. Jesus said, the poor you'll have always with you. There's some things that is going to go with us to the grave. You can't keep focusing on those things, friends. You got to take your eyes off of those things and look to Jesus and know that God is able. Take our eyes off of the things that are around us and know we got a responsibility to the lost of this city. We can't wait for the Baptists to do it. The Catholic can't do it. The Moravians are able, unable to do it. The Episcopals can't do it. We've got to do it. The apostolic that know the truth of God's word. That tell people they need to be repenting and be baptized in Jesus' name. And to get the Holy Ghost. And then to earnestly contend for the faith that was once delivered to the saints of God. We've got to make them know because they don't know. They're not aware of it. They just feel like many... Many people in this town simply feel that you just raise your hand, repeat the sinner's prayer, and you're saved and ready for heaven. We know that's not true. 
The Bible clearly delineates that that's a lie. So if we know someone that has gone through that kind of a procedure, we need to have a Bible study with them. We need to apprise them of the word of God. We need to say, friend, all of that won't help you. So we need to take responsibility for the lost. So teach a home Bible study. I know we've had at least three how to teach home Bible study seminars so far. And we've had many that have come and have invested time and energy. So to the rest of this church family, I'm going to invite you to invest in a chart. Invest in a manual and get to work. Amen. The rewards are eternal. Please notice Jesus' remarks in John chapter 4, verse 35 and 6. Say not ye that there are yet four months and then cometh the harvest. That's what they were saying. The harvest not yet. Four more months and then comes the harvest. But Jesus challenged them. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields. For they are, are white, all ready to harvest. Now observe. And he that reapeth receiveth wages and gathereth fruit unto life eternal that both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice together. So Jesus says, I got a I got payday for you if you will go into the harvest. If you will get out of where you are and invest your life in the harvest. Quit thinking about what's in it for me anyhow. But get yourself together and go into the harvest. Jesus is saying, if you do that, I got a reward for you. And saints of God, I am mindful of this world. I'm mindful of the time that we're living in. I'm mindful of the nearness of the Lord. Time is winding down. I was just telling someone just recently in regards to the time that we're in. And I made mention that the tabernacle is a pattern of what God is doing in the economy of dealing with mankind. And the holy place, I believe, represent the time of the church age. And that church age is really right where we are today. And you will see that the Based on the dimension of that holy place, that was roughly about 2,000 in dimension in the, in the cubic uh, uh, that, that the Jews used. And so, when we translate that into where we are, we realize that the church age is roughly about 2,000 years. And right now, we are creeping up toward that time. So we don't have a lot of time left. Time is winding now. Now, people say, well, from the very start, we've been hearing that the Lord is coming. But at some point in time, he will get here. The Bible says, though we tarry, you need to wait for it. And again, that God is not going to delay his coming forever. As we hasten our steps to reach the lost, actually we are trying to hasten the Lord here. Because he said that the, the, the gospel would preach, should be preaching all the world and then the end is going to come. But he has a time limit on that. And I'm suggesting to you that, that time is winding down. So there's some people that are planning to 50 years. I don't believe we'll be here. Some people are planning for 100 years. I don't believe the church is going to be around. 
So we've got to do everything that we can to bring in souls before time winds down. I look in this world and I look at all the preparation for war. War on every side. There's not war, there's rumors of war. This is becoming bellicose. This is becoming belligerent. This is taking an ugly turn. You think that this world is going to be sustained for very long? I don't think so. This world is on a chart, is on a course to destruction. And we know that by reading the word of God. It brings us right into perspective knowing that the day is short and the Lord is at hand. We have got to reach the world that we live in. We can't just get bogged down with all of our little stuff that we're dealing with. We simply can't. Because if we do, when the Lord comes, he's going to ask us if we had all of the things that we have, how come we didn't reach the world? In Acts chapter 19, the Bible says this. Paul spent about two and a half years in Asia. And the Bible says all of Asia heard the word of God in the space of two and a half years. All of them. We've been in here in Tampa now for some 19 and a half years, and we still got to reach a lot of people. We got to reach them with Bible salvation. I don't care what kind of church they're in. If they haven't repented of their sin, they're not baptized in Jesus' name. They don't have the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in tongues. They're not contending for the, the, the faith that was once delivered unto the saints. They don't have the apostle doctrine. They don't have Bible salvation. If they don't have it, people of God, they simply do not have Bible salvation. And if they don't have Bible salvation, it's people that is lost. They tell me of one church in Texas. In that church, they don't even preach against sin. They don't even mention sin. Because they feel that they're going to impose something on the people's psyche. That the people are going to be discouraged. Well, how is it that people are so smart today that they know more than God? Because God sent Jonah down to Nineveh. He said, tell Nineveh, it's either you repent or you're going to die. And Jonah reached into Nineveh and he says, yet 40 days and Nineveh is going to be overthrown. How is people going to repent if they don't know they need to repent? How will people get right if, they don't, if they're not told to repent? They've got to be told to repent. So that entire church over there is hell bound. You can take up preachers. You can get all upset. But I'm telling you, except they repent, Jesus said they'll all, all be lost. They have got to know they need to repent. It's no use telling them they feel good about themselves. Don't tell. It's no point in, in them feeling that they don't have sin, friend. They need to be saved. If some of them are shacked up in that place, hell, they're going to go. There's no point in letting people feel good in sin. What kind of good outcome is that? The Bible said that hell has enlarged herself. Do you think it's for furniture? Do you think it's for trees? Do you think it's for rocks? Hell has enlarged. In other words, there is a building program, an expansion in hell. So, preacher, where do you preach like that? Well, it's in your scripture. Hell has enlarged itself. There is an expansion in hell. Why is there an expansion in hell? It's because our population is increasing and people are not repenting. We need to let people know it is time to repent because the Lord is soon to come. And friend, as much as in me is, I'm going to try and let them know. I'm going to try and teach and preach and encourage and and do everything that I can because people has got to know they got to get in church before that great day. 
Noah warned for some years, 120 years it is thought, and every time Noah is nailing that nail or he is driving a, a, something into that boat, it was a testament that the Lord was going to come. And some people felt, well, how come, how come Noah preaching all that time and no rain? But the Bible says that they were not mindful of the word of that man until the very day that Noah entered into the ark. And the Bible, Jesus himself said that the flood came and took them all away. Jesus said that. And he then later added, as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the coming of the Son of Man. People are going to be in the stock market investing. People are going to be on Wall Street doing their business. People are going to be in the streets of Tampa doing what they want to do. Until the Lord sound that trumpet. Until that angel lifts his hand up with one foot upon the sea and one on the land and said time shall no longer be. People are still going to be doing what they're doing today. And we would be remiss if we didn't lift our voice like a trumpet and let people know the Lord is soon to come. We have got to do that. We got to tell it on the market street. We got to tell it in the busy street, in the supermarket, everywhere we go, that the Lord is soon to come. Don't get bogged down with your 401k. You have got to get ready for God. We have got to be con concerned about the lost. When we see just over the precipice, there is a place in hell. We have got to let our family members know it's time to get out of those Baptist churches, out of those denominational churches. It's time to get right with. We have got to know that. Don't you tell them they're okay. Don't you tell them that every road leads to heaven. Don't you dare let them feel okay. You've got to know truth. You've got to love truth. You've got to embrace truth. You've got to know there is one Lord, one faith, one baptism. Paul said, though we are an angel from heaven, preach any other doctrine unto you, let him be accursed. We can't become so merciful and so right to not let people know what the Bible says. People need to know what the Bible says. God doesn't care what some seminarian says. God doesn't care what some preacher is talking about. He said in the word of God, he says, I'm God and I change not. In Hebrews chapter 13, the Bible said Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And if Peter said they need to repent and be baptized in Jesus' name, then they must repent and baptize in Jesus' name. Jesus said they've got to be born of water and spirit. It means they have got to repent and be born of water and spirit. There's no option. People say, why are you so judgmental? We're not judgmental. It's God that is judgmental. We are the one that will let you come into heaven anyway. But God says no. So you don't have an issue with this preacher. You have an issue with God. So every man have to go in the face of God and take it up with him. These scriptures were here long before I got here. And if I had my way, I would make heaven so easy to get into. Everybody will go in there. And of course, once we get there with all of the stuff that people are going to be bringing up in there, they want, we all want to get out of there. But somebody say, heaven is a holy place. Filled with glory and grace and sin can never enter there. The writer says sin will stop you at the door and cast you out forevermore because sin can never enter there. So we got to let people know because they do not know. There are people in houses of worship in America that don't know they have to be baptized in Jesus' name right today. 
There are people in houses of worship today that don't know that they need to be born of the Spirit. Most of them think they just hold up their hand and repeat the sinner's prayer and then they're okay. And it was Paul that says that there is one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. We got to get a Bible study chart. We got to get a manual. And we got to sit down and say, friend, I know you've heard it another, another way, but here is what the word of God says. Let them read, their, read it from their own Bible. Lest they say you are reading it from your own Bible. Let them read it. And when I caused them to read their own Bible, I said, well, they didn't know it was in the Bible. Yeah, it's in there. And the thing about it is this. Jesus said you need to search the scriptures. He said the scriptures are there. You need to go search it. Don't, re don't rely on what somebody said. Go search it for yourself. There are more Bibles in America than any place else on earth. So there's not, there is one American can never say, Lord, I didn't know. Jesus is going to say, you didn't search the scripture. You had it. And ignorance of the law is no excuse. You need to search the scriptures. So if you have family member that has never been baptized in Jesus' name and have the Holy Ghost with the initial evidence of speaking in tongues, you need to get on your knee and you need to get a Bible study chart and say, friend, I want to teach you a Bible study. I want, to, I want you to hear what the Word of God said. And who knows, they might repent. You don't know if they will repent. When, when Jonah went into Nineveh and he preached... He, uh, and, and Jonah never even had a great text. He wasn't eloquent. He simply said, yet 40 days and Nineveh is going to be overthrown. And when word came to the king, he came off of his throne. He let his servant go on fast. The very animal in the, the field went on fast. Because he says, who can tell if God wouldn't turn around? And God saw the repentance and God turned around and forgave that people and they were saved. Who can tell if you had a study with your unsaved relative that they won't turn? Who can tell that they won't repent and get the Holy Ghost right in that room? But you've got to get concerned about their soul salvation. You've got to get concerned about them going into hell. Hell is a hot place and hell is for eternity. Once they're in hell, there's no room to get out of there. Hell is an awful place. Jesus said more about hell and not going to hell than he did about heaven and going to heaven. So I'm concerned about people that's not saved. And every saint of God need to do something for the church and your responsibility to the lost. We have people in this city and in this country that say a lot of things that the Bible is against that they're okay living in that. Homosexuality is pervasive in this place. Why? Because I said God turned his mind and God is okay with it now. And I wonder what, what kind of God keep changing his mind. What else is he going to change? You can't, you can't change God's mind. I can't change his mind. If God hates something, he's going to hate it unto the end. He's not changing. And when Saul came into the kingdom, God said, you need to go and break down all of the, the, the room, all of the houses of the, the, those, the, those, and uh, they called them sodomites back then. You know, people today, they really don't want to offend people. The thing about God, he doesn't care if people are offended. He owns heaven. He owns hell too. He doesn't care. He told them, break down all the houses of the Sodomites. Break them down. Paul's admonition to those that were in that kind of lifestyle, it's time to repent. 
but they've got places in America that they have churches that's dedicated to homosexual. They feel like they found a God that will smile upon their lifestyle. But I'm here to tell you that God didn't like them from back then, and he still don't like them now. He want them to repent. He want them to go to an altar and repent and change what they've been thinking and get right with God. Because God loved the homosexual, but he hate the ways. He hate the lifestyle. It's repugnant to God. It's an, abom I'm an ab it's an abomination to God. It is above just simple sin. It is an abomination. But you've got people in this place telling people that it's okay because God said it's okay. And you know, some people are so foolish that they'll buy into that. But we've got to have that Bible study. And we need to tell them, say, friend, how you're living, God is not going to accept that. If you're shacked up, you need to know that God is not going to accept that. If you love that girl, marry that girl. If you don't love her, get out of there and leave her alone. Let her go get her life together. We've got to do that. All of those places that people go to gamble, we got to know that all gamblers are hell bound. People need to know that. Gamblers and, and drunkards, they've got to change. They've got to get right with God. They've got to get the Holy Ghost. They've got to clean up their life. We have got to have a Bible study with them. This is no time to let people feel they're going to heaven in sin. It's either we need to preach the Bible or quit preaching. This is no time, amen, for people to feel like everything is okay with God because God is so merciful. Yeah, God is merciful, but he's also a just God. And so we need to get a Bible study chart, get a manual, read the lesson, and they sit down and, and teach them. Let them know that God loves them. They may be in sin now, but God can bring them out of darkness into marvelous life. They may not be right with God, but let them know that there is room at the cross. Uh, amen. Their million have come. There is still room for one. There is room at the cross. Let them, amen, let them know that God loved them, but he hate the sin. Hallelujah, friend. Amen. We need, to, we, we, need to, we need to be holding this world right over into the lake of fire so that they can feel the fire. This business of letting people feel okay in sin is not right. Hallelujah. This is, this, is, this is apostolic preaching. We, we, we don't get that in other churches, but this, this is what apostolic preaching let them know. It is time to change. Sister Anita, where are you at? There you are. Stand up, baby. Sister Anita, she got her, I think, is it two Bible studies? Two Bible studies. Two of them been baptized so far? How many received the Holy Ghost? One received the Holy Ghost. She's been teaching Bible stuff. She's just been in the, in the church for, for a short time. But she got her a chart. She got her a manual. She is teaching Bible study. People are getting saved. Everybody ought to get excited and get zealous and start teaching a Bible study because the Lord is soon to come. God bless you, baby. You may be seated. It's not time to sit back on our laurels and let people go to hell like that. That's not, to me, that's not right. You know, one songwriter said, he, he said part of the lyrics, he says, you met me day by day and you knew I was astray, but you never mentioned Jesus to me. There are people here who know the truth. You have family members and you never told them that Jesus loved them and that Jesus will save them if they will repent. You never took the time to teach them a Bible study. You never took the time to show them what is right. The Bible says this. He says Sodom and Gomorrah will rise up in that day 
and condemn this generation. The men of Nineveh will rise up in that day and condemn that generation because generation in, in Nineveh repented just at a few words. We need to give people a few words now. It's time to get people to repent. I got a text, I think it was a couple of days ago, from Sister Tiana. Is Sister Tiana here? She, she's over there doing children's church. And, and she, in the text she says, which commentary, what, which Bible commentaries did you recommend us to have? Now, I, I don't necessarily, you don't necessarily have to have Bible commentary to, to teach home Bible study. But she said, Wh which were those commentary? And I told her, I said, you know, you can use, we sometimes use Adam Clark and we use uh, Jameson Fawcett and Brown. You can use those. That, those will help you. And so by the time I had the time to text her back yesterday, she said she already started her Bible study. What am I saying? It's time to get yourself a chart and start teaching. Take your eye off of your problem. Get your eye off of your problem. I had one phone call from one young lady, and she said, oh, things are going so bad with her, and this, uh, this is not right, and she doesn't feel well because things are not going. I said, sis. I said, baby, you need to quit fooling around. You need to come here. I'll give you a Bible study chart. I'll give you a manual, and you go teach Bible study. Get your eye off of all of your problem. Get, go, come on now. It's time to get your eye off of all your troubles. Some years ago, I went to teach one man a Bible study. He was just a stump of a man. Both feet cut off at the knees. Both hands cut off the elbow. He's just on that little stool there. Just a stump of a man. So you think you have some trouble? A lot of times we, we feel we have some trouble until we see real trouble. You need to take your eye off all of the stuff that ails you and turn your eye to Jesus. Uh, Jesus, I'm lifting up my eye and I see the wide it feel going to hell. I need to go teach them a Bible study. Forget about the stuff that is around me. Let me go teach them so I can pull them out of hell. Oh yeah, friend. That's what that's what we're that's what we're all about. Then number two, we can contact some of our neighborhood families and invite them to the house of the Lord. Many of them said the reason why they don't come to church, nobody invited them. Let's not give them that excuse. Let's go invite them to church. Number three, give out business cards. Just recently, I told you about we've got 10,000 business cards. That we want people to take one, take a, a stack of seven cards each week and give out one card each day. Tell them that you want them to come to church. Use it as an invitation. So that means in the course of one year, you would have issued 300 and 65 invitation to come to the house of God. One person. And so if I had 820 people that did the same thing, just one card per day, in the space of one year, there would have been 300,000 invitation given. 300,000 invitation given. If we did that for five years, it means that there would have been 1.5 million invitation given. If just 1% of that 1.5 million got saved, it means that there would be 15,000 people added to the New Life family of churches. In five years, 15,000. We gotta, we, we, we got, we've gotta start that. Paul went through all kinds.
tons of trouble just to get the message of God to people that were lost. We can do no less because we want to match up beside them. We want to walk up in the same room they're at. Then, therefore, we got to start doing something to show God that we mean business. Quit talking about all the problems we have. That's why God is not even looking at the problems we have because we're not doing what he is asking us to do. If we start getting involved where God is getting involved, he'll, he'll take care of some of those problems. And I learned a lot of long time ago, I can't get bogged down with the problems I have. I'm going to probably have all of those problems. We want at least 40,000 people in our churches in this city. We're tired of these little small apostolic churches. I mean, hell is just too big. We, we want, we, I don't want anybody else to go in hell. I want to pull them out of hell. Hell has enough. We need to pull them out. We don't want people from Tampa. And every man in every city need to be saying the same thing. I need people that's in Tampa to get in apostolic churches. And then we need to pray that families get a burden to go and help up with daughter churches. We need to plant churches everywhere. McDonald's have all kind of franchises all over the place. We need to be putting churches all over the place too. Once they've got a, once they've got a physical meal, we're going to give them a spiritual meal. Hallelujah. We want, we want them safe. And I'm closing. But I want us a, a church to get excited because the Lord is soon to come. There are many of us who have big church, big houses here. And guess what? We're going to leave them here when we get out of here. And we're not going to be like Mrs. Lot looking back on these things. When we're out of here, we're out of here. And so we need to quit being part-time saints. We need to quit being part-time Christians because that's what most people are today, just part-time Christians. I get so many calls and text messages. Oh, pastor, I won't be in church today. I'm going to do this. I'm doing that. That's all they are, part-time Christians. I mean, that's deplorable. I need to be serving God full-time. I expect a full-time a full pay. I don't want the Lord just to give me a little part-time pay. Might not feel bad if, I'm, if you work, presumably you work all week, and suppose now you were assessed on the, the number of hours you really worked, and you weren't doing a real good job, and everybody getting a full pay, and you'd only get maybe th one-third of a paycheck, I know you wouldn't be happy. I know most people get all worked up when, it, when people start dealing with their monies now. They're okay if you do stuff else, something else, but once you start fooling around with their paycheck, they're not even happy. So if the Lord start cutting us short, I know we're not going to be happy. I know I wouldn't be happy. Oh, oh no. I heard one, one man, and this just uh, an illustration now, that they went to heaven. Everybody was showing their house, big mansion, 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 big mansion. And so he wondered about, well, you're showing everybody else about the house. Well, how about mine? What's mine? So he took them down, way down, way in the back. Just a little doghouse. Said this, this, this is all you sent up material to build. This all. Oh, this is all you laid up in heaven. This little doghouse, that's all you can afford. Jesus said we ought to lay up treasure in heaven. If you're not sending up any material friend, you may not even have a doghouse up there. I want to make sure that I'm sending up some quality material. Let me know I'm teaching some serious Bible study. Let me know that I'm visiting the lost. Let, let me know that I'm concerned. Let me know I'm, I'm plugged into where Jesus is. I need to send up some quality material to build a quality mansion over there. You can stand up. I'm done. I want to 
wonder if the singers could get ready to sing that I'm sold out. I think we need to get sold out for Jesus. Paul said that we, we must do it heartily as unto the Lord. Everything we do, we should know we're doing it unto the Lord. You're not doing it unto me. I'm doing it unto the Lord myself. I'm working for the Lord myself. He is the inspector. He is the one that receives everything, and he is the one that is going to reward us too. I'm looking for my reward. And then you'll notice Esther 4.14. Not only that he is the inspector, not only is the one that receives all of that, not only that he gives the reward because we're working for Jesus. Look at the very ending right after that colon. And who knoweth whether thou art come to the kingdom for such a time as this? Who knows that God got you into the church because there was a loss in your family. Who know that God brought you into this marvelous life because there was a relative that you need to teach that Bible study? Who knows if you are come to the kingdom for such a time?